From the City of Angels, near the Pacific Ocean, good morning, good evening, wherever you may be across the nation, around the world. I'm George Norrie. Welcome to Coast to Coast AM. Later on tonight, big miracles. I mean big ones. Here's what's happening. Breaking news. Michael Flynn abruptly resigning as President Donald Trump's national security advisor tonight, hours after it was learned that the Justice Department had informed the White House that it believed that he could be subjected to blackmail by Russia. Flynn's status was considered perilous after it was disclosed that he had misled, maybe he lied, they say, Vice President Michael Pence and other senior officials about his communications with Russia's ambassador to the United States. More on that story as it unfolds tomorrow, I'm sure. The ballistic missile that North Korea claimed it successfully test-fired over the weekend probably traveled farther than any other missile launched by the rogue nation. The missile traveled roughly 300 miles into the Sea of Japan, did not enter Japanese waters. It was launched on a high trajectory, traveling for 14 minutes before splashing down. Prosecutors in Puerto Rico have smashed a ring of current and former U.S. TSA workers that apparently smuggled 20 tons of cocaine worth as much as $100 million into the United States over more than a decade. A massive avalanche killing four snowboarders near a popular resort in the French Alps. Shares of Apple rose to a record high close on Monday, propped up by Wall Street's expectations that the release of a 10th anniversary iPhone and pent-up customer demand will shore up lackluster sales. That's good news for them. Registered investment advisor Michael Mish Shedlock with us. Mish, a few weeks ago we had a psychic on the air who said that the stock market was going to collapse right about now. It hasn't happened yet. No, it hasn't. And uh, well, we've discussed this before. The stock market's overvalued, and it's going to come down. We don't know when, and we don't know from what level. My favorite scenario is actually, and I'll repeat it again, not a crash, but rather once it starts going, it's just going to keep going slowly down for a number of years. This is what Japan did. Meanwhile, I, I and we've talked about this before too, George. I'm very concerned over a collapse in global trade. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trump has rattled sabers with China, although he backed down, and I'm encouraged by that. He rattled sabers with Mexico. I'm hoping he backs down with that. So we'll have to see. But uh, it was a collapse in global trade that exasperated the Great Depression, we're on the verge of another such incident. I'm hoping, George, that we pull back from that and do the right thing. Here. What kind of great mish do you give the psychic? I would say D, probably. <laughs> I think crashes are extremely rare and 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 hard to predict. That's a good the, point. The, the, there were a number of people actually, and actually I was one of them, calling for a crash uh, in in 2007, 2008. But the economic conditions now are quite different. Back then we had a housing bubble. We had a, an environment in which it was impossible or nearly impossible for corporations to roll over corporate debt. Right now, with what the Fed has done, they've really goosed the um, corporate bond market here. They're ready and willing to step in if there's another credit crunch. So I don't think we're going to have a credit crunch again. So I don't think we're going to have a crash again. Al Jarreau, the jazz pop musician best known for the hits Breaking Away and We're in This Love Together, and the theme song to the popular 1980s television show Moonlighting, died Sunday, according to posts on his verified social media accounts. He was 76 years old. Right before the Grammy Awards, he passed on great jazz singer Al Jarreau dead at the age of 76. A massive crevice that formed in a spillway at Northern California's Oroville Dam has spurred mass evacuations with nearby residents fleeing the worst-case specter of a three-story wall of water rushing downstream. In all, 188,000 people, mostly in three counties up there, evacuated from the area, some being given 
only minutes to gather their things. That's an unbelievable story. I mean, just months ago, California was in a massive drought. Now they may have too much water right now. Chemicals banned in the 1970s have been found in the deepest reaches of the Pacific Ocean, according to a new study. Scientists surprised by the relatively high concentrations of pollutants like PCBs and PBDEs in the deep sea area. NASA is preparing a mission to send a lander to Europa, offering humanity's best chance, they say, of meeting aliens. The space agency is putting together plans to send a lander to Europa, one of Jupiter's moons and perhaps the most likely place to harbor some extraterrestrial life anywhere near us. But first, we'll have to work out exactly how to land on a surface about which it knows next to nothing about. Stephen Bassett, by the way, who heads up the Paradigm Research Group, looking for disclosure with us. That's an exciting mission, Stephen, and I wanted to get a quick update from you on our GoFundMe campaign. It's starting to build up for you, isn't it? Yeah, and I certainly appreciate the fact that Coast to Coast is uh, promoting this and helping PRG to gather more funds to be able to pursue the dis- disclosure of the ET presence by the by the President of the United States, hopefully this year. And uh, it's making a little progress, and people go to GoFundMe.com or your site where there's a link, and then or they can do a search on um, um, Truth Embargo, and the, the GoFundMe comes directly up. With respect to the announcement, well, you know, George, Richard Hoagland and I agreed many, many years ago that NASA and the government had a soft disclosure timeline, mm-hmm. a drip, drip, drip process in which they slowly mention and escalate the possibility of life outside the planet. Uh, and if, unless you've been living in a cave for the last 10 years, you can't go two weeks without some announcement about life here, life there, That's water right. on Mars, maybe life on Mars, panspermia, life can exist in space. And this ultimately leads, I think, to an announcement. Yes, there's life outside the planet. Cool. Uh, but they do have a small problem. And this is a quote, paraphrasing a quote from Carl Sagan, who once said that if they find one living cell off the planet Earth anywhere, it means that there is life absolutely throughout the entire galaxy. Yep. And so while at the same time they're looking for life and spending millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to do this, they completely ignore the evidence that we're being contacted right now. <laughs> they're making right it easy now, for us, aren't they? Yeah, and, and, and so there's kind of a, a dichotomy there. But, you know, let's face it. Let them do their soft disclosure. We're going to pursue disclosure of the ET presence, and the two will merge together one day. They sure will. Stephen, thank you. Stephen Bassett, by the way, and we're helping him out uh, developing some fun so we can get some disclosure, and there's a link at coasttocoastam.com. NOAA forecasters say there's a 40% chance of a polar geomagnetic storm in a few days when a solar wind stream hits planet Earth. Let's hope it's not that big. Let's check in with astronomer Stephen Cates. What's in the skies this week, Stephen? Well, George, always exciting stuff, and Jupiter continues to be in our report this week, as you were mentioning, and Stephen was mentioning very eloquently. We need to find out what's out there in the universe, and we're pretty much confident that life indeed does abound out there. We just have to find it. But going back to the NASA Juno spacecraft for a moment, we haven't spoken about that. On February 7th, George, this spacecraft imaged what's called Jupiter's South Pole, like the Antarctica of Jupiter, and found some totally amazing images of violent storms, actually more like artwork. And this is great because so many people out there, all of us have an opportunity through NASA to check on their Juno camera. You can go to the NASA website for the Juno spacecraft. Just look for the Juno camera. People like ourselves are being asked, what imaging and what areas on Jupiter would you like the spacecraft to go and examine? And people like ourselves are examining these pictures. Quite exciting to get citizen science going. The spacecraft, George, orbits around the planet Jupiter every 53 days. And as your guest mentioned before, this whole mission to the object, the satellite, one of the Galilean satellites, Europa, is so important. Congressman John Culberson pushing again for the Europa multiple flyby mission in 2022. He wants to land on Europa. But if you go back to the sequel to the great movie 2001, the Kubrick epic, this is what was said, and Dave Bowman, the astronaut, said it so well, and I quote, all these worlds are yours except Europa. <laughs> Attempt no landing. Uh-huh. But finally, George, in the live sky, we have the 18-day-old moon. People can see that live right now. And how about talking about the center of all the attention here, Jupiter? It's easy to see. Look into the morning sky. Actually, for many people right now, George, you can see it. 
brilliant object 450 million miles away, just below it, a star called Spica in Virgo, 262 light years away. Its light left here, or I should say the star to get here, in 1755 when the first steam engines in America were developed quite a long time ago. So simply this, always remember to keep your eyes to the skies. Thank you, Stephen. Appreciate it. Dr. Sky. So Hawaii is our 50th state. Or is it? We're going to talk about that next on Coast to Coast AM. Welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Nori with you. Our guest tonight, Dr. David Keanu Sai. We're going to call him Keanu Sai. That's his name. The doctor has got a Ph.D. in political science, specializing in international relations and public law. His doctoral research focused on the continued existence of the Hawaiian kingdom as a sovereign and independent state that has been under an illegal and prolonged occupation by the United States since the Spanish-American War. Dr. Sai also represented the Hawaiian Kingdom in international arbitration proceedings held under the auspices of the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And here he is on Coast to Coast with a very interesting story. Doctor, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, George. I've got some friends in Hawaii, and there there is definitely a mood of a Hawaiian sovereignty movement out there from a number of people who do not believe that they should be or are a part of the United States. How long has this been going on, Doctor? It's actually it's an outgrowth of what we call the Hawaiian Renaissance. Uh, that was a cultural revival. It started around the 1960s. Uh, it created a political wing uh, probably around the 1970s, and today it has come to be known as the uh, Hawaiian Sovereignty Movement. Now, now, the sovereignty movement, though, is not what I'm involved with. The sovereignty movement operates on the premise that Hawaii is a part of the United States, and it's attempting to break away. So you have those who are for independence, and then others who re- want to remain within the United States to have a relationship, relationship similar to Native Americans. My research, which is based um, on law and uh, legal theory and historical facts, operates from the premise that Hawaii was never part of the United States. So it's not an issue of trying to break away, but rather explaining what actually happened. Uh, something really simple could be put, it could pretty much be simply said in this way. Hawaii was kidnapped, but it was treated like it was adopted. We can't find the adoption papers. <laughs> or maybe the birth records, too, right? <laughs> we'll get into that. Now, do the people generally in Hawaii, though, want to be part of the United States? Well, before we, we can ask people if they want to be a part of the United States, we have to, first of all, clarify whether or not Hawaii is a part of the United States. And when I say that, it has to be from a legal standpoint, not from a political perspective or a position statement. Once we understand the true legal status of Hawaii, then questions can ensue from that point, right? So you don't want to jump ahead and say, should Hawaii become? Should Hawaii remain a part of the United States, or should people want to believe we're part of the United States, without first addressing the issue of whether or not Hawaii is a part of the United States from a legal standpoint? Okay, and apparently, at least most people think it received statehood back in 1959. Explain, if you would, for us, Keanu, the process of how the United States believes Hawaii became a state. Well, it goes back to 1898 during the Spanish-American War. The United States Congress passed a law called the Joint Resolution of Annexation, annexing Hawaii, supposedly making it a part of the United States. In the year 1900, the United States Congress passed another law changing the name of the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom to be called the Territory of Hawaii. And then in 1959, the United States Congress passed another law changing the name from the territory of Hawaii to the state of Hawaii. Now, from a, a, a narrative, uh, from a position of, uh, of a narrative of events, okay, it started from 1898, Congress passed the law annexing Hawaii. That, that event right there is problematic because the United States Congress cannot pass a law annexing foreign territory. What was Hawaii at the time prior to that? Was it, was it a little country? What was it? Well, actually, you know, that's a very good question. Hawaii, since 1843, was actually recognized as an independent state and a member of the Family of Nations. In fact, Hawaii had an embassy 
in Washington, D.C. in 1893, since 1850s. Uh, the Hawaiian Kingdom, or Hawaii, also had consulates in New York, San Francisco, Philadelphia, San Diego, Boston, Portland, Port Townsend, Washington, and Seattle. Oh, my God. So clearly, know. Hawaii was a country, uh, and it wasn't a native tribe, but rather a multi-ethnic country, and its citizenry, they were called Hawaiian subjects. So when I speak of that country, my great-grandparents were born in the 1880. They were born in that country called the Hawaiian Kingdom. So... When we speak of the Hawaiian Kingdom, it's not that far back. It's not ancient history. It's really right at the turn of two generations. Yeah. So when Hawaii was a country at that time, okay, it had treaties with the United States. It had a trade agreement in 1875. It was called a reciprocity treaty. Mm-hmm. It also had a most favored nation treaty in 1849. You know, And for Americans to live in Hawaii... They were subject to Hawaiian Kingdom law, and for Hawaiian subjects living in America, they were subject to American law. So Hawaii had that status. Uh, it had that status. Now, in 1893, the United States ambassador assigned to Hawaii, his name is John Stevens, uh, he created a puppet government here through an insurgency. He provided them diplomatic protection and allowed them to go to Washington, D.C., to sign a treaty of annexation in 1893, the ambassador was attempting to acquire Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was very significant uh, for from a strategic standpoint. Right. Of course. The problem was, though, Hawaii in 1893 and throughout the 19th century was an internationally recognized neutral state. So back in the 19th century, you only had four countries that were neutral, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Belgium, and Hawaii. So when war took place in the Pacific, uh, 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 naval vessels could actually access Hawaiian ports because it's neutral, unarm or disarm, uh, refurbish, leave Hawaiian territory, rearm, and go back to fighting. Hawaii played that role as a neutral state. So it cannot be taken. For, and it could have been for the Japanese as well, then, I take it. Well, absolutely. It's for any sovereign state under international law, they could have access to Hawaii's neutrality. Yeah, absolutely. So so the ambassador, though, the, he was moving into changing the idea that let's get Hawaii as a military outpost, but because he could not invade a foreign country and a neutral country at that, he, he, he collaborated with a few individuals who were going to proclaim themselves to be a, prov- a provisional government, which he would protect by landing U.S. Marines. And these individuals then traveled to Washington and signed a treaty with President Harrison, annexing Hawaii. Now, under international law, you could acquire even a neutral state if there was a treaty. The problem is this entity claiming to be the new government was not a government, but rather a puppet government. Now, the following president, President Cleveland, in 1893, in March, when he came into office during inauguration, he received a diplomatic protest from Queen Lili Okalani, who was the head of state of the Hawaiian Kingdom, who told him that U.S. Marines had overthrown a friendly country's government, and that he asked, she asked the president to do an investigation. Well, in April, an investigation was initiated uh, by uh, the former chairman of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs. His name is James Blount. And James Blount traveled to Hawaii started his investigation on April 1st, 1893, completed his investigation in July, and was reporting his findings to the Secretary of State, Walter Gresham. Walter Gresham concluded in October of 1893 that the United States bears the sole responsibility for the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian government. And then President Cleveland notified Congress in a message on December 18th. Now, in international law, You can't overthrow a government without overthrowing a country. So what took place in 1893 with the U.S. ambassador propping up these insurgents as if they were a bona fide government, the the, the seizure of the Hawaiian government did not equate to the overthrow of the country of the Hawaiian kingdom. You still needed a treaty in order for the United States to have acquired the Hawaiian kingdom. But President Cleveland withdrew that treaty that was formerly under President Harrison when he submitted it back in February. All right, hold on, David. We're going to hit this break, but I want to come back and we'll talk more about this uh, this very strange story of whether Hawaii is indeed the 50th state of the United States. 
We've got more when we come back. The free Coast Zone email newsletter is sent out six days a week and is a great way to keep up on all things Coast. With detailed program recaps, the fascinating Today in Strangeness listing, upcoming guest info, and weekly free audio clips, it's a must-have for Coast fans. Look for the free sign-up on the coasttocoastam.com homepage. Hey, by the way, something else for you to do, circle your calendar if you live in the greater Los Angeles area, or if you want to visit L.A. May 6th from 5 to 8 p.m., that's a Saturday night in Northridge, California, we are going to have a live stage show event with some great guests, Dr. Bruce Goldberg on past life regression, Daniel Brinkley on his near-death experiences, contactee Whitley Streber as well, a meet and greet immediately after that, and uh, I'll have a little surprise or two there for you, too. Tickets available at Ticketmaster.com. Put my name in the search engine there, and they'll find it. Ticketmaster.com or call 1-800-745-3000. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. We're talking with David Keanu Sai, Dr. David Keanu Sai, as we talk about Hawaii and a beautiful state. I can say that, I guess, but it's a beautiful place, David. But let's get back into this intrigue about uh, what happened. So during World War II, when we had Pearl Harbor uh, as, as a base and that horrible tragedy that occurred, how did we get there to build that uh, that whole base? Well, in 1898, it was the annexation resolution passed by Congress when Hawaii was unilaterally seized during the Spanish-American War. Once America sent their troops to Hawaii to fight the Spanish in Guam and the Philippines, after the war, it, they didn't leave. And that's when they began to build up uh, military installations in the Hawaiian Islands, which included Pearl Harbor. Uh, currently today, we have over 118 military installations in the islands. Now, the people of Hawaii... Have they been polled yet about this, or I, I, I'm, I'd be very interested to see how the majority would feel about all of this? Well, um, what really happened, um, you know, like I shared earlier, this this country, the Hawaiian Kingdom, is where my great-grandparents were born into, you know, so I'm a direct descendant of Hawaiian subjects, as many people in Hawaii are. Uh, when America took over in 1898, you actually had... A, a, a formal policy of Americanization being implemented throughout the schools, all the schools throughout the island. So my grandparents' generation were basically brainwashed to believe they're American and to speak English. Hawaiian was a national language in the country, but you had to speak English, and if you did speak Hawaiian, you were actually beaten. And we have those stories from uh, grandparents that share that. Now, by the time I got to my parents' generation in school, it's already institutionalized. All they knew that this was America. And by the time it got to me when I went to high school, I didn't know anything, nothing at all. So I didn't know this before, but it was through research that it began to uncover it. And that's when the, 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 the oh, that, that's when you went, that's when I went from the, uh, to, to borrow the expression, I went from the OMG to the WTF. Well, and let me, let me ask you this though. I mean, I spent nine years in the Navy, um, visited uh, Pearl Harbor. Mm-hmm. I love America. I would I would give my life for it. Uh, do people in Hawaii, most of them, not want to be part of the United States? Well, they don't know the history, that's why. Like for myself, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. I'm a retired captain from the Army. Um, served in both active and reserve. And I'm sure you love the United States, too. Oh, no, this is not against, exactly. I'm not (laughs) anti-American, not at all. Um, But I'm a retired captain, so I I take things seriously. And and, and when it comes to putting your life on the line, well, I was there. I've been been there and done that. I actually attended a military college after high school. That's where I got my commission as a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's not in question for me. (laughs) It's just the reality check of, wait a minute, is Hawaii a part of the United States? Because once I began to uncover this information, just from a simple inquiring mind wanted to know. You know, I just it took, I went, okay, let's look at the intel on this. And when I began to, what I began to uncover was just mind blowing. I couldn't believe it. 
Um, my last command, I was a battery commander, M102, 105 howitzers. I was in the Hawaii Army National Guard. I began to then question, am I in the, am I in the right army? I began to question, my, am I an American citizen? Now, this is after we did training in teams, uh, the battle exercise of team spirit in South Korea. Uh, went to battle exercises in Hokkaido, Japan. So I was very much military-minded, and I had no problem, you know, fighting. Uh, we were trained for that. But it got personal for me because then if Hawaii is not a part of the United States, then how do I explain why I'm in a foreign army? That only forced me to, to retire I was honorably discharged, and I pursued this path of posing questions that I needed to find answers. And that eventually got me to where I'm at now, where I have a Ph.D. in this, and I, I'm a faculty member at the University of Hawaii, where we teach this. And I don't teach it politically. I teach it historically. And, and it's, it, it's not pro-Hawaiian. It's not pro-American. It's not anti-Hawaiian. It's not anti-American. It's just... Here it is. Well, are you saying that through legal snafus that Hawaii is not a state of the United States? It isn't. It really simply goes back to the United States could not pass a law in 1898 annexing a foreign territory. The United States could no more annex Hawaii by passing a law in 1898 than the United States Congress can pass a law today annexing Canada. It has no effect beyond the borders of the United well, how States. Come, treaty. How, come, a treaty. how come no legal minds stopped this at that time? Oh, they were bringing it up, trust me. They in, were? In the congressional record, oh, absolutely. Senator Augustus Bacon from Georgia, he specifically stated on the congressional record that you cannot annex a foreign territory by passing a law. You need a treaty. And then uh, Thomas, uh, 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 Representative uh, Thomas Ball from Texas, he even said the same thing. He said, this is illegal. Now, let's fast forward to 1988. The Department of Justice, Office of Legal Counsel, the Attorney General's Office in Washington, D.C., they concluded in a legal opinion that it is unclear which constitutional Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by a joint resolution. They, con they, they concluded that. So this is not legal interpretation. <laughs> it's just this a reassessment of the facts, and which gets people to think, why didn't we see this today? They did see it back then. Oh, this was all in the newspapers, all over, across America. And, and it seems like it's growing again. Is that a pretty accurate assessment? Well, I think what's growing here is not a physical revolution. I call it a cerebral revolution. It's all in the head. It's really just, it's a paradigm shift. And, and I, I'm a firm believer in education. And academic research and analytical rigor will get to the heart of these issues. It's like peeling an onion, layer by layer, all these lies to getting to this main kernel in saying Hawaii's still a country. So it's a process. You know, I'm not I'm not into getting people to rally, I'm not into rallying the troops. Well, in, in your opinion, education. in your opinion, Keanu, everyone born in Hawaii to date, right. are they? <laughs> Are they not American citizens? Well, if you look at how the nationality law works, okay, so under in the Hawaiian Kingdom, if you were born in the country, you acquire Hawaiian citizenship. It's called natural born. So you had Americans who gave birth to a child, let's say in Honolulu, that child would be a dual citizen, an American by parentage and a Hawaiian by, by birth. Okay? But when occupation takes place, the law of occupation, this falls under what is called international humanitarian law. When the law of occupation kicks in, when a country is occupied, the only way that you can acquire the citizenship is by your parents, not by birth on the soil. Not it prevents birth. people from acquiring citizenship by birth, including for myself. So I'm not a Hawaiian subject because I was born in Hawaii, but I'm a Hawaiian subject because I'm a direct descendant of a Hawaiian subject. Where would that have put Barack Obama? Okay, so Barack Obama was born actually in the same hospital that I was just two years earlier. <laughs> he was born in 1961. I was born in 1964, three okay. years earlier, excuse me, the Piolani Hospital. Now, Barack Obama's parents, he is an American from his mom, and he was Kenyan by his dad, okay? But he did not acquire birth or Hawaiian citizenship by being born here in Hawaii. 
because he was born outside of the United States. So the birthers are right for all the wrong reasons. He was actually born in Hawaii, which is outside of the United States. So, so, t- so not te- natural born, but he's still an American from his mom. All right, but so technically he was not eligible to run for president, you're saying? According to the United States Constitution, yes, Article 2. Wow. It's a little late for that now, I guess. Huh? I, you know, I'm just, I'm calling the bear of bad news. <laughs> These are just the facts. <laughs> now, what is going on in terms of any legality, any litigation, or what what happens next here? Well, the key here is to expose, to to understand. It, 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 that's what the real issue is. The, what what took away the memory of the Hawaiian Kingdom at the turn of the the, the 20th century, yeah, in the early 1900s, was a, a, a massive re-education throughout the schools. There was an Americanization. In order to counter that, we need to bring in the facts, not Hawaiianization, but we need to bring in the facts that address that Americanization. So it's really uh, uh, digging into certain issues and questioning things that we would never question before. But the university system is, is capable of doing that. You know, this is not something that you just want to talk over the, the coffee table because it could get quite tense. <laughs> you know, but it's education. And I can tell you that through education, people are starting to understand this. And I can honestly say as well in my classes at the university, the ones who see this the quickest are the students that are not from Hawaii but from the United States because they're outside of the problem. For people here, it's like you're being told you lived a lie, and you don't take it well. And things that you were led to believe are not necessarily true. So it takes quite a bit for local people to grapple with this. But outside, well, they see it. And the ones who actually see it the quickest are military people, because I use it, I, I, I approach it from a military standpoint, as if I'm the S2 giving intel. Now, in your opinion, if the United States uh, admitted, oh boy, we made a mistake, Hawaii is not a state, how could they fix that? How could they change that to get Hawaii as a state? Well, you don't have somebody kidnapped and tell them that how you fix this, you get adopted. You know, the fact that Hawaii was kidnapped, that that's a violation of international law. And the fact that Hawaii was neutral and it still is neutral, international law even more so protects that. So this is not about trying to get America to fix the problem. You don't fix the problem by making an illegal situation legal and just say you're, you're adopted. <laughs> There's a lot of things that happened in the past. So, so we need to understand first that Hawaii was never part of the United States, and let's look at it from that perspective. And what does international law say about this? And then we use precedents throughout the world to see how we can fix this problem. The way you fix this problem, George, is the the occupation has to come to an end. This is the longest-running occupation in the history of international relations. The the, the, the first longest, well, the recent longest history of occupation was the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, by the Soviet Union from 1941 to 1991. The longest right now appears to be uh, the Palestinian, the Israeli occupation of Palestine. For Hawaii, this is, this is going over 100 years. And the lapse of time did not change the legality. And that's why it's important that people just need to understand what's going on and make informed decisions. Is it ever going to get to the Supreme Court? I mean, will it go that way? Well, see, the problem is the United States Congress and the United States Supreme Court have no authority in foreign countries. No, no, I mean for them to at least say and rule that the United States did not have the right to do this. Somebody's got to make that mandate, right? No, it's actually the facts themselves which show it. And it's really international courts or international bodies that address these issues, not the United States courts, because they're limited to U.S. territory. If anything, what is uh, to be uh, responding on this issue from the United States government, it's not the legislative or the judicial branches, but actually the executive branch. It's, it's the Department of Defense and the State Department. Those are the two branches that address this type of an issue. And here we get into issues of treaties, uh, get into issues of violation of treaties. 
And we also start to get into the fact that Hawaii, what has been committed since, since 1893 to the present, is interpreted within international law as war crimes. So that's humanitarian law. These kind of issues are being addressed gradually by the international community. And I've been involved in some uh, international proceedings, and I can attest to the fact that, oh, they're, they're just as shocked as, as, as you are, George. I am. <laughs> but I am, Dave. They can't deny the information. It's, 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 it's quite perplexing. In your opinion, what are the odds of Hawaii not being part of the United States? Well, it's 100% because it never was a part of the United States. Well, let me, but let's let's just, let's assume for people to think it's no longer part of the United States. I mean, right now, most people think it is. I and do, that's, and, and, and that's a better question. People assume, or people their their knowledge. Okay, that's different from the facts. But what people believe, and whether or not, and when that will change, I think time will only tell. Um, as people become more informed, but it doesn't stop proceedings from taking place that I participated in at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in the Netherlands. And the Permanent Court of Arbitration actually verified that the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists, that it's not a part of the United States. And it was based upon that conclusion is when the Permanent Court of Arbitration created and established a tribunal to address a particular dispute between a Hawaiian subject and the acting government. The Permanent Court of Arbitration would have never created a tribunal if it did not first vet the question whether or not the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. Prior to countries like us getting involved, you were talking about how it was a neutrality, so there must have been a lot of com- got countries involved. But prior to the United States stepping in, mm-hmm. who governed Hawaii? I mean, how did it run? Hawaii was a constitutional monarchy, uh, very progressive. It was one of the first constitutional monarchies amongst the family of nations. Hawaii was in the family of nations since 1843. Great Britain and France joined your recognized Hawaiian independence. And, you know, one thing that, George, I think you may not have known, but when you came to Hawaii, did you notice on the flag for the state of Hawaii there was a Union Jack? Yes. Okay. I remember that. That flag is actually from the Hawaiian Kingdom era. Did you know that Hawaii was actually part of the British Empire? It wasn't a colony. But in 1794, King Kamehameha I joined the British Empire, and he recognized King George III as his emperor. Huh. Yeah. And in 1843, Queen Victoria recognized Hawaii's separation from Great Britain as an independent state. But we still had that Union Jack in the flag, because we used to be British. <laughs> well, when we take phone calls next hour with you, David... Uh, we're going to open up the phone lines, and, and I'm going to do something a little differently because we have uh, west of the Rocky lines, east of the Rockies, all that, first-time caller lines. All the lines, wild-card lines, all the lines are available to you folks in Hawaii because I want your comments on this, too. So don't worry about whether you're calling east of the Rockies or whatever. Just call if you want to get in on any of the lines that you hear us give you. And uh, let's get your comments on that too. And David, so when you talk to people in Hawaii, what do they say? What do they? How do they feel about this? Well, obviously, it's, I mean, well, I gotta admit, when I returned from the Netherlands after the hearing in at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, we knew that we had to address the denationalization, the Americanization that took place, and we had to do that through education. So I entered the University of Hawaii, the Political Science Department. To, to get a master's degree specializing in international relations and then later a PhD. So I used the university system to do research, to publish papers, uh, law articles. Um, I have a history book now. I can tell you from, from, from 2001 when the case ended at The Hague to now, the level of awareness has grown drastically. It's, it, it, it has greatly increased where people are becoming comfortable with the terms. And, and people are now asking, how do we fix the problem? What a story. It really is. Well, David, stay with us. We've got another hour to go with you. Dr. David Keanu Sai. we're going to take phone calls. And as I mentioned, anybody from Hawaii, feel free to call in on any line. We'll be back. 